Let's start again. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for the late start of our seminar with uh, Ventus Wealth and Tony Bell, who runs one of our funds, the My Plan Global Macro Fund. And good afternoon, Tony. How are things in Cape Town? Good afternoon, Magnus. Very, very wet. Very wet. It's about time for the Cape to get a bit wet. But to all our participants who are dining in, and we have very uh, close to a thousand participants, thank you for waiting a couple of minutes. We're having technical problems, like we always have with normal seminars as well. But we're going to uh, try and explain to you, and, and the technical problems is that we cannot share our graphs or charts that we wanted to share with you. We will um, let's get them to you in due course. The, the talk today is about an hour long. I'll be talking for five to 10 minutes. And then Tony will run through the way that he invests money and has been doing so successfully for Brentist on a special mandate for a number of years with great success uh, to our clients. Now the background to the seminar today and those are the charts that we cannot show you is the um, relative underperformance of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange versus global markets over the last couple of years, which um, is not, in our opinion, discussed enough by the media, websites, radio stations, etc. And if one looks at the performance of the JSE in, in, in RAND terms over the last 10 years, for instance, the JSE has done about 100% return over 10 years, which equates to about 7 or 8% per annum over the 10 year period. Relative to world markets, which in RAND terms have done anything between 300 to 500, and in fact, more than 1000%, if one looks at the NASDAQ as the primary driver of investment returns over the last couple of years. But it's over the last five years, ladies and gentlemen, that the performance or the, the lack of performance by the JSC has suddenly become even worse. And if I tell you that the average return on the JSC for a general equity fund has been zero over five years, um, many people might be shocked by that, but many people will also agree with that because they are opening up their statements on an ongoing basis and saying, where has the growth been? And in fact, uh, at the end of my little talk, I'll give you an example of the relative difference between JSC versus global markets with, re with regards to the performance of the MyPlan funds. So uh, for the last five years and, 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 and to a greater extent, 10 years, the JSC, which is the primary wealth creator for most South Africans, who have their money in pension funds, retirement funds, retirement annuities, et cetera, they've actually um, gone backward in when, especially when you especially when you convert it into into dollar terms. And over a five year period, for instance, and in fact over a ten year period, the JC has returned zero in dollar terms. So on on a relative basis, if we can use the analogy of the Comrades Marathon we all started at the same base 10 years ago, but um, as the race progresses, we are just getting further and further behind. And compared to the NASDAQ and the FANG stocks, the, the internet stocks, we are just way, way behind. The winner's already having a shower and we're still in the middle of the race. So, so to put it into context, why, why um, has, is this happening? And then a lot of reasons, and Tony will expound on that, but we at Brentus have been trying to get this message across that there have been some structural problems uh, in the South African economy, which mitigate, uh, mitigates against higher growth. We have the state capture. We've had uh, the rising, uh, increasing regulations by government. We had BEE factors. Uh, we had the Gupta saga and the flight of money, et cetera, et cetera, and a general destruction of wealth on a global scale in South Africa. And, 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 and this has been underreported by our larger fund managers 
who are sitting in a position that they are sitting with very large South African assets and sometimes find it difficult to get this message across to their clients because it's against their own business to inform people that the, the local market is not doing well. At the end of my little introduction and at the end of the talk, I might make some more comments. I just took a comparison with the, the um, performance of the MyPlan Global Macro Fund or the IP Opportunity Fund, which Tony runs for Braintest. And I took a hypothetical investment of 1 million Rand five years ago as a lump sum investment. And and the fact is that, in fact, we perhaps we can see this on the screen now, but 1 million Rand invested in Tony's fund five years ago is worth 2.1 million Rand today. I compared that with a general equity fund over a five year period, the PSG equity fund. And I chose that fund for a specific reason because PSG does not have any NOSPAS or process in its portfolio. So it represents the performance of the South African economy on the JSE, excluding NOSPAS, which has distorted the performance of the JSE in many respects. So five years later, the rand value of that investment today is 750,000 rand. Now that's an astonishing difference of 1.35 million rand in favor of someone who invested with Tony, as opposed to someone who invested with a local fund. And tongue in cheek, I tweeted that one could have invested that amount of money five years ago in the MyPlan fund and relative to the PSG fund, which is one of our top 10 funds in the country, you could have today have bought a house and a motor car and still have the same amount of money left in your PSG fund. And one can do that with other uh, of the big global equity funds and you would get the same kind of returns. So there's been a massive wealth destruction and it's still taking place in South Africa relative to what you could have had you invested the money offshore as we have been recommending for a very long time. So with great pleasure for me to hand you over to Tony. Tony's been managing our fund for about five years. It's the single largest holding in our range of funds that we offer clients. And with the results that our clients have been very, very happy with the returns. Returns have been averaging 15 to 16% per annum relative to the zero returns that I referred to earlier and the minus returns uh, as well. So Tony, over to you. Many thanks for the great work that you've done for our clients. And I look forward to hearing your presentation. Magnus, uh, thank you very much. Often in everyone from a very wet and rainy Cape Town. I understand that I can share my screen, so I will process, proceed with that now. Um, Magnus, can you see the screen? I'm assuming everyone can see the screen. Uh, what I'd like to do, to do today is just do a very brief performance update of the fund, um, give some sense around the uh, risk statistics. And then as Magnus requested, I'm going to spend a few minutes just chatting about where I believe Alpha comes from. By way of background, for those of you that, who don't know me, I started life in, in accounting. I realized that auditing with no disrespect to any auditors listening in wasn't my future. In about 1986, I joined Southern Life, um, witnessed the 1987 crash. I uh, ended up um, running the team at Cyprus Managed Assets from 94 through to 2000. And ever since then, I have uh, been involved in one way or another with what was Peregrine Quant and Banani Fund Managers today. So it's both my great pleasure and great honor to be entrusted with client money from Brenthurst. Uh, and I'd really just like to unpack my alpha thesis. Uh, there's a lot that's written about where alpha comes from, a lot of very, very complex mathematical arguments. And I'm going to try and simplify it down to three very basic uh, drivers. 
And then probably the pressing issue why most people have joined in today, and I see there are over 800, thank you very much for your time, is trying to make sense of the world in 2020. There's a lot of media disinformation. I'm not very big on fake news. For those of you who know me well, I don't have a TV set and I don't read any newspapers. So I'm trying to make sense from what the markets are telling me, and I'll convey that through in a couple of forms that I think might uh, be surprising to you. And then leading in, I want to try and unpack for you how I've positioned the fund both currently and what I see the opportunities uh, in the future. Very pleasingly, the fund has done well. For the past year, we are up 33% versus the sector average of 24. For the past uh, three years, we are up 68% or 19% compound per annum versus the industry at 40 or 11.9% compound. And then it's been my great pleasure to run this fund for the past five years since inception. We've delivered 20.2% compared to the sector average of 13. What's particularly pleasing about the returns is that they're not lumpy. You can see that the charts uh, follow one another quite closely, but the gap opens up sequentially over time. And that's what I'm looking to do is to add alpha consistently over time. From a risk perspective, I know there are a lot of numbers on the screen, but the most important thing are the colors. Blue is good, red is bad. Thankfully, there's no red on the screen. Uh, yellow and green are acceptable. And particularly important to me in running the fund is I focus not only on the alpha generation, which you can see in the first column, but I'm particularly preoccupied with managing drawdown risk. The fund has a flexible benchmark, 85% benchmarks against the MSCI, 10% against USD and 5% czar. Uh, and so for me, the flexibility exists to move into cash when we've, we go into a risk off period, as we have very recently, but then move back into a fully invested period when I see the opportunities uh, to present themselves. And particularly pleasing in the fund on both a one, three and six year basis are the two columns on the right hand side which reflect the negative period ranking as well as the positive period ranking, um, both downside and upside sitting in, in very comfortable space. Our industry is replete with many theories around alpha generation. And so what I'm going to do in the next slide or two is just set a bit of context. We have a world that is changing very quickly. I haven't counted how many themes are on the slide, but for those that are mathematically adept, it's uh, five down by two, four, six across. Um, there's a lot of themes. The world is changing both socially, uh, geographically, culturally. Um, it's very difficult to pick one of these themes and say, this is an alpha opportunity. Uh, the way I look at markets is everything is interlinked and the markets paint a picture uh, in terms of where these trends are going and how they're revolving. And part of my role in managing the funds is really to stitch together what's happening in each of these trends with a view to being able to understand the companies that operate in these uh, very, very dynamic environments who's going to thrive and who's not. I grew up in a world of discounted cash flow calculations as every accountant is trained to do. But the challenge that one has when you approach alpha generation on a global scale is that companies have become exceedingly complex. This particularly interesting schematic shows Google on the left and it shows Apple on the right. These are the emails and research project notes that have been circulated internally by employees of each company. And you can see just visually that Google is far more uh, spread out, far more distributed. Apple is a lot more concentrated in certain key products. But the point of the slide is to say, well, if this is what's happening internally, 
within the different major groups, how does one model this in terms of a cash flow and, and financial DCF valuation? It's become very, very complex. So that really got me to exploring over the past 30 years where Alpha comes from. And I would put forward today for today's webinar presentation three primary sources. The first source is when equity markets de-risk. I've been through 87, 92, 94, all the way through to this year. And I'll show you in a moment uh, why I believe that during those periods, uh, price does differ from value. But for the periods that are interconnected between the sell-offs, the market is very accurate at discounting future earnings growth and the rates of change. And so the insight that I'd like to share with you today, and it really is quite a simple insight, but taken many, many years to get here, is that one can find alpha opportunities if you focus on companies where the rate of change of earnings is positive, in other words, earnings are going up, and that rate of change is increasing, as distinct from companies where earnings are declining and the price decline is in anticipation of earnings decline. I think this might be the most contentious point. Our industry and many of my very learned colleagues in the industry tend to move into the space of declining prices with a view to believing that the stock could present value or may be cheap. Um, I'll share with you in a moment why I think that is very, very difficult to do. And so I prefer to focus my attention on the top two. I aggressively manage risk when markets are de-risking, but simultaneously look for opportunity in the dislocation between value and price. And my major thesis in alpha generation, as I will share with you in a short while, is if you can differentiate between two and three, you can avoid the drawdowns in three, the capitalization of the rate of change of price in two generates significant alpha over time. So one of the things I find fairly poorly understood in the market is, is in the analysis of alpha is where alpha comes from. This particularly interesting chart takes a well-known South African unit trust and it just plots its performance relative to the SWIX index. The line itself is the SWIX index and the skyscraper bars show you how on a rolling 12 month basis, this particular fund has delivered alpha. Um, without spending a lot of time on it, you can review this at your leisure when you get a copy of the slide pack. You will see very clearly that the skyscrapers uh, are more pronounced when the market has declined and the manager in question has been able to exploit the difference between value and price. As equity markets mature, as you can see from the left-hand side of the chart moving up to the peak in 2008, is there significant alpha compression? Um, and I think this is where the debate often gets lost between active managers and index managers is towards the mature phase of a bull market, alpha compression does exist, but when markets dislocate, alpha opportunities, as, it, as is the case at the moment, are quite abundant. So on to points number two and three. What I've plotted here on the horizontal axis is the compound rate of change in earnings growth of companies just represented by dots and on the vertical axis, what each company has produced in terms of annualized return. The, top, the, the, the companies in the top right-hand corner, um, for me, are attractive. The companies in the bottom left-hand quadrant aren't attractive. And so what I studiously avoid is looking for companies in the bottom left-hand quadrant where the earnings may have declined as well as the price decline, believing that there is some sort of return to a normalization of earnings and therefore the companies present value. Very difficult to do. Um, many in the industry do try and do it, but I have found generally 
if I avoid those companies and I focus on picking companies where the rate of change of earnings growth is positive and accelerating the alpha opportunity set is much richer. And I'll demonstrate that to you in a moment. So one of the problems that one has is the accuracy of earnings forecasts. And I'm just going to share with you on the next two or three slides how the story unfolds. Uh, I snipped this off Yahoo Finance this morning. It's Amazon's earnings forecast for the year ahead. There are 49 analysts involved. I would expect most of them are reasonably well paid. The average estimate is $38. Uh, last year, Amazon earned $23, but I found it astounding that the gap between the bottom or the lowest estimate and the highest estimate is more than the average forecast for next year. So as you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, the low estimate is 17, the high estimate is 57. So in journeying through my investment career, I had to think about how to resolve this problem. If I took the consensus earnings, I would be in no different position from everyone else. If I spent many, many hours and worked really hard to try and come up with a better forecast, I would probably be somewhere in the range of $17 to 57, but would my forecast accuracy be high enough to be able to generate uh, alpha opportunity? And this was the subject of a academic paper by Gleason, Johnson and Lee in 2006 that pretty much changed my world forever. Uh, Gleason and his team studied 136,000 sell side uh, forecasts and they ranked them into quintiles for the purpose of demonstration. I've just done quartiles. What they found is out of the 136, thousand forecasts. The top quartile were fairly accurate. They had a forecast absolute error of about 13%. But the second, third and fourth quintile of quartiles were from very poor, poor to very poor to atrocious. They didn't lose too much hope um, in terms of trying to find some value in the data. And so what they did in the process was they resampled the top quartile and they split that into quartiles and they found that uh, the top quartile of the top quartile were very accurate. So to put it into round numbers, uh, the top 11% of those 136,000 analysts were extremely accurate and they produced quite significant alpha opportunity because they could get the earnings forecasts right. The question I had to pose to myself in running a global portfolio, was I good enough in running valuation models to be in the top quartile of the top quartile? And I'll leave you to answer that question for yourself, but my answer was probably not. So how then was I going to go about identifying those companies that could move into that top right-hand quadrant on the chart? And when I started to study companies in more detail, I found that the rate of increase in earnings became far more important than just being accurate about your forecast one, two, or even three years out. I think what the Gleason paper amply demonstrates is whether you're in the field of economics or whether you're in the field of earnings forecast, it's very, very difficult to do. And so using a combination of insights from Mabusen on complex theory, and some Bayesian probability, I started to think differently about the problem. And what I found was that the market itself is very accurate at iteratively forecasting the rate of change of earnings growth. So here you see the rate of increase of Amazon's earnings growth. When I had the pleasure of starting the fund for Magnus, uh, Amazon was trading at about $250 as I recall. Uh, we had a lot of Amazon at that time. I think the price earnings multiple was something like 260. And the standard question I got asked at most seminars was, don't you think you're overpaying for Amazon? Uh, Amazon sits well north of $1,000 these days. And I think the history book has, uh, has written Jeff Bezos into it. 
So what you can see is for a period of time from August 2013 to 2015, Amazon's earnings were apparently flat. And they then started to increase quite dramatically. Uh, and of course, in more recent periods, the line looks impressive, but the rate of change of earnings growth has slowed. And not wanting to just be dependent on consensus earnings forecasts, I started to work out a methodology where the price movement could help me understand what the inferred rate of change of earnings growth was going to be without having to rely on consensus broker forecasts. And that's the area that I, I have pursued quite diligently in the last six years with, with a reasonable amount of success. How do I do it? Having trained up as an accountant, you just don't lose that sense of how to look at companies. I often tell the story um, fondly so of my audit principal, Jack Zeller, who would take me on audits and then sit me down and say to me, um, what do you see? And, and I'd sort of be a little bit confused in the beginning. And after a while, I started to understand what Jack was talking about. Everyone can read a trial balance if you're trained to do so, a balance sheet or an income statement. But what you really want to do is you want to understand the picture that you expect to see being painted about a company. And then you want to dig deeply into the numbers to see whether the numbers themselves are painting the picture that you see, not the other way around. And so what I do before I look at any numbers, I spend a lot of time unpacking these seven factors. I want to understand each of the 11 gig sectors to the best of my ability. I want to go into companies and understand what makes them better, what's proprietary about them. I know most regulators don't like monopolies and pricing powers and trade secrets, but from an investor perspective, I find those very key brand attributes because they create what is euphemistically referred to as a moat around a company's brand value. I then want to go and dig in a little bit more deeply into what the power law looks like. How can a company take its product and its price, sorry, with its people and, and create some su significant and sustainable competitive advantages? Uh, all of the above works particularly well, but unless the, I can figure out how the company is going to leverage its network distribution it won't create economies of scale, and in that process will not leverage the rate of change of earnings growth, as we saw on the previous slide with Amazon. Uh, the other lesson Jack taught me, follow the cash. Um, we're all very familiar with the fact that accounting can be very creative. And so as a matter of course, I convert everything to cash equivalent and follow the cash uh, very, very, very fastidiously. Um, an, an old discipline of mine is I continue to write up notes for myself, do detailed report on each company that I invest in, because I want to make sure that I understand the dynamics of how these seven factors are linking together in order to create the potential rate of change in earnings growth that I'm looking for. We are living in a new world. I am, for those that know me well, I am the least quantitative person you will ever meet. But I have conceptually put together an algorithm which helps me understand what the potential rate of change of earnings growth is going to be in a company. And I try and represent it for you on the screen with a simple set of pluses over different periods. So the way the algorithm is constructed is that it looks back one month, six months, 12 months, and it, it essentially sets down whether the market is still positive on a company's earnings growth prospects and whether those earnings growth prospects are improving or not. This is not a tool that I use to decide on whether to buy into a company or not, but it helps me start to differentiate between companies that have the potential to generate top quartile earnings growth versus the companies that don't. 
So going back to the Gleason paper, this is the way in which I have addressed the earnings forecast issue and the lack of accuracy in earnings forecast by being able to sort companies that are prospectively very good from those that are bad. And then lastly, on this sort of very interesting looking chart, courtesy of a company in Cape Town called IMAPS, I do a very detailed risk assessment to see uh, what the positional size should be of each company and the extent to which I've got stock specific risk in the portfolio. So that is a general sort of take on how I approach the portfolio. I will wrap it up towards the end of the presentation with a detailed review of the portfolio. But I think the bottom line is, I hope by now that you, you find the approach to be very sensible, um, very common sense and very logical. And that the key takeaway is it's all about minimizing forecast error. Uh, in the process of both selection and construction. Within um, the next few minutes, I'm going to have a look at the pressing issues that are up on the screen. Why did the world change so quickly in March, in February? Was it all about coronavirus? Will the packages that are currently being thrown at the market be enough? What has the equity market discounted? A lot of people are commenting and very concerned about the disconnect between the movement of the S&P and the underlying economy. And then are we really at risk of another major secular decline in equity prices? How am I thinking about this? The next slide or two is probably going to be a little unexpected for most of you. I don't think the equity market in, in February came unglued because of coronavirus. I think the symptoms were there quite a lot earlier. The chart that you're looking at is the interbank rate in the US um, without getting into a technical de detailed explanation of what it is. It's simply the rate at which commercial banks borrow from the Fed. You can see based on the first arrow in September last year that there was quite a, a squeeze in the interbank market. It meant that banks were short of cash the Fed intervened quite aggressively, but you can see in late February this year just how that market seized up again. And that's in terms of my interpretation and, and uh, uh, submission today is, is, was the start of, of what caused the, 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 the decline in equity prices. Most of the equity market um, crashes that I've been through or significant declines in equities have been through some sort of liquidity driven event. It normally starts in the interbank market and not surprisingly, it moves to the credit market quite quickly. What you see on this chart is the US triple B uh, credit spread to US govies. And as the interbank market started to freeze up, credit spread started to move out and uh, the rest pretty much ended up in the equity market. I think coronavirus came along at a very inopportune time while these markets were freezing up and they really are the third effect, which was the knock on effect to the economy. So the risks to the equity market, as I saw it in February and March, were number one, liquidity risk in the interbank market. Number two, the expansion of credit risk in the credit markets and now three, through the economic effect. And this is a risk that the central banks are still grappling with uh, is the solvency risk of economies of, of, sorry, of companies going to the wall. So what the Fed has done is move very aggressively. I hope you can see this. There are two lines on the screen. The sort of white solid line that's shaded is the S&P 500 and the pink colored line is the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. The first arrow in the middle of the chart looks at the extent of the expansion when Paulson and Bernanke went to Congress to ask for the approval of around 750 billion. I remember at that time we all thought that that was exceptionally high. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the amount of liquidity that's currently being pumped into the markets is quite unprecedented. By the time the Fed finishes, we may be sitting with a Fed balance sheet of close to 12 trillion. Uh, this is an enormous amount of money that's been put in 
not only to save the financial system, but I would submit that perhaps the real target is governments who have become too big to fail and the underlying economy where that solvency risk could not be entertained by the Fed. How have equity markets responded? Uh, the top chart looks at the longer term uh, trend analysis of the S&P and you can see the very big bounce off March. I do like the patterning that's taking place. The market is finding solid support. And my, my sort of thesis on the equity market at the moment, particularly the S&P, is that it's more significantly driven by liquidity than the market being concerned about earnings and price earnings valuation. We saw the same in March of 2009. I uh, remember those times were quite dire and the economic predictions were equally poor, but I think the old adage of you can't fight the Fed is certainly playing out this time. The strange looking chart in front of you really deals with the difference in performance across uh, the major gig sectors. Top right hand side is good, bottom left hand side is poor, and you can see that the market has become highly differentiated. We see this in the selection between an Amazon and a booking.com or a travel company like Carnival Cruise Liners. So financial index, very poor. Energy index, very poor. Real estate, very poor. But the discretionary consumer, the consumer staples, the healthcare and the infotech sectors have done very well up on the top right hand corner. So from a fund positioning, what have we favored and where do we see the opportunities? On the left-hand panel, you can see courtesy of uh, Alpine Macro, research company that we use, uh, the weak balance sheet companies are very out of favor. I think this partly goes to a margin of safety argument, but I'd also like to suggest that a takeaway from today is think of equities as long duration bonds with growth. So as interest rates have been suppressed, QE1, and as money has been pumped into the system, QE2, the value to investors of being invested in dividend producing and growth oriented companies has attracted a premium price, a premium value, and therefore investors have naturally tended towards favoring those companies that can uh, maintain and sustain cash flow, the payment of dividends and the delivery of earnings growth. That having been said on the right hand side, you can see the dislocation of the energy sector. Uh, certainly certain travel companies would be down there as well. And I'll highlight in a slide or two where I think the opportunities exist in that space. So the portfolio itself should never surprise you. Um, I am inherently conservative in nature. Uh, I tend to look at position sizing in pairs. And so I'll, I'll look to see what Microsoft best pairs with. Is it an Apple? Is it a Google? Uh, does Visa pair with PayPal and or MasterCard? And then how do all the companies within the the selection of the portfolio fit together so that they paint the picture of the macro environment that we're looking at at the moment. As you can see on the left hand chart, the um, portfolio itself has a very nice spread across sectors. We have favored healthcare, consumer staples, consumer discretionary, which as I showed you two slides ago have done very well. The portfolios had quite a material holding in gold. I did take it down as low as 60% in equity in February. And as the market rallied through March, I brought that back up to 85%. Uh, and I have been playing, um, I sort of playing, I have been uh, investing in the currency markets um, by looking at alternatives to the dollar. Uh, but I think that's a subject for, for, a, for a future unpack. So what you really are looking at from a structural point of view is a portfolio at the moment that's largely focused on the US. 
I do see China as an emerging opportunity into the future. Uh, in this portfolio, I hold an ETF in the form of, form of uh, AAJX, which is A Asia X Japan. Uh, and I think for now, the, the opportunity to um, uh, get exposure to the Asian world through ETFs is very prudent, but I see that as an opportunity for alpha generation into the future. So just nearing towards the end of the presentation, Magnus, building on our alpha thesis, I have plotted for you the potential earnings growth of companies over the next two years and the current rating of those stocks on the vertical axis. And you can see that stocks like Amazon and Netflix, American Tower, Intuitive Surgical, have probably in the short term been given a premium rating more than they deserve for the earnings that they're likely to deliver. Down on the bottom right hand side, you've got booking.com and that old uh, industrial company called General Electric. Um, I'm busy looking at booking.com. I think there's some interesting developments there. Um, but then down towards the left hand side, you can see that there's a, a vast array of companies that whilst they're clustered together, the absolute numbers are still very attractive. 10 to 30% earnings growth in a world where you've got US treasuries trading at 0.6% means that these companies are gonna to continue to deliver or potentially deliver solid returns because their earnings growth is both, both positive and potentially going higher. So just to um, wrap everything up, I know we've been through a lot, but I'll try and summarize it for you. I think the, the equity market responded uh, in February and March to liquidity risks that had developed in September already in the interbank market. Those uh, risks tightened up again in February this year, as I shared with you. Uh, added to that, we had credit risks, and then we had the prospect um, of um, solvency risk as coronavirus started to move across the world. Uh, central banks have responded with unprecedented levels of infusion of liquidity, and I think they will continue to do that. Um, the goal is important, I think, to unpack. When a central bank uh, engages in money printing to the extent that many of the central banks are, it may be inflationary longer term, but I don't think in a deflationary world that we're in, that that is the primary concern. This is a currency war. It's a, it's a race to weaken your currency. It's a race to try and import inflation. And it's a, um, a, a step taken by central banks to try and avoid solvency risk. So without putting too fine a point in, on it, I think we're witnessing monetary policy version three the technical term is debt monetization on a huge scale. And I would suggest or advance the theory that this is probably the biggest change in the modern monetary system since Bretton Woods was, in, was, was introduced post the Second World War. Um, by the time central banks have finished stimulating this time around, we could be looking at north of 15 trillion of new money having been introduced and most of it would be to underpin the funding required by governments to support companies and to get economies going again. So I think uh, my view at the moment is equity markets are likely to continue be driven, being driven by liquidity. The duration effect of uh, the dividends and the cash flow we've spoken about, but one must be very conscious of solvency risk. It's the third part of the equation and with this amount of money coming in, we haven't yet seen the impacts of solvency risk. And that's something that I'm very mindful of. So in positioning the portfolio, I remain focused on growth vectors. I see opportunity in energy and travel. I'm busy taking advantage of that, but for the short term, I'm reasonably fully invested. Magnus, that's um, my bit, back to you. Tony, thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can see me. We've sorted out Mike 
my technical um, problem, so I'm going to quickly run through my screens, but we've been getting a lot of questions coming um, onto our, our chat line, and we're going to try and answer a couple of them. You can also direct your questions to info, or I beg your pardon, invest at brentestwealth.coza, and a lot of people are asking about whether the presentation will be made available and the answer is yes. So if you want it, email invest at bentestwealth.coza and we will send that to you. Let's see if I can quickly get all my, uh, my, my slides. Yep, looks like we've got it. So just to recap um, why um, it's not working, let's see. No, it is working. Sorry, I've got my technical team rushing towards me, trying to solve the problem. I would like you to see these. Um, I would like you to see these slides. There we go. We've got it. So my apologies for for everybody. We got it. This is new to me, guys. It's like a it's like a second date. You still don't know what to do so these things are still very uh, fresh uh, for a an old topic like me but what we've been saying for quite some time is that the south african market has been has been underperforming the stock markets of the world for a very very long time and uh, you need to see this graphically there you do there's the jsc 10 years of underperformance, I call it. And, and, and as I said to you earlier, the JSC has done in rand terms 244 uh, from a base of 100, so that's 144. But if you look at the performance of, you know, the NASDAQ 1,328, the S&P 767%, that's the space that Tony's been finding value for us, even comparing us to the emerging market and, and uh, world markets, we've just been lagging and we've been running far behind as far as, as um, the rest of the world is concerned. Let's go. Um, then we, um, come, come on. Then we're looking at uh, the next slide. Yeah, that's the 10 year number. We do. Sorry, my apologies, we are not getting the next slide up. Okay, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it. I'm gonna stop it. I'm trying to, uh, once again, just try. There's one particular slide I would like you to see, but we're not getting there. I'm going to have to rely on your indulgence. Here it is. This is the um, JSE over five years. And you can see there that the JSE has done zero growth. The bottom line, the green at the bottom, effectively you've made no money by investing in the JSE. And if you strip out, if you strip out NOSPERS, the, the results are even worse. And I've used this as a, an example, a random sense example of a million rand hypothetically invested with the My Plan Global Macro Fund or the IP Opportunity Fund that Tony runs for us, the numbers are about the same. And you put it into the PSG Equity Fund, same day, same amount. What is the outcome? And that is very important to investors. Well, the outcome is that today or yesterday, with Tony's fund, you would have 2 million and 20 odd thousand rand in your bank account. And with the PSG Equity Fund, which is one of our top funds, but it does not include NOSPAS, they don't use NOSPAS, or they don't believe it's a growth stock, your result is you've got 750,000 Rand in your bank account. And as I earlier said, that's a difference of 1.3 odd 5 million Rand. Now you can buy a, a, a smallish house for 1 million Rand. You can buy a smallish car for the balance and you can still have the same amount of money left in your account with, as, as if you've got the money with your PSG investment. And that's not only PSG, there are a host of them 
that have similar kinds of returns. So these returns matter. And these, uh, that's what investors want. They want the outcomes to be in their favor. So, and if one compares the last slide, just a tongue in cheek, David versus Goliath. I've compared Tony's fund and I've compared it with the well known brand names, the Alan Gray Orbis funds, massive funds, so hauling in billions of rands every year from investors. We tend to trade on the, the brand value relative to the performance value. Now, this is where we become very unpopular in the investment world, myself and our advisors at Brentist. We work for our clients and we point out that when people ask us, why are we not invested in Alan Gray or whatever, we say we are driven by performance. <clears throat> and the fact is that the Orbis fund into which the Alan Gray feeds into has not beaten its benchmark for 10 years. And there again, same type of fund, same period, there's a difference of almost 400,000 Rand over a five year period of time. So outcomes matter to us at Brentus, ladies and gentlemen, and you can get information about our funds and, 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 and the My Plan funds, the IP Opportunity funds. Once again, at any of our offices, we have six offices countrywide. And um, we're gonna end up by taking one or two questions. Tony, one of the questions were your view on the currency. Could you just uh, maybe deliver a comment on that? And then we can take one or two more questions before we have to end. Sure, Magnus. If for those that are interested, James Records wrote a very interesting book in 2011 called Currency Wars. And his follow-up uh, book published in 2016 was The Road to Ruin. Um, He's an interesting gentleman to, to follow because he was senior legal counsel at uh, long-term capital management. For those of you that may recall, long-term capital management blew up spectacularly in about 1998. Um, Magnus, to answer your question, I think we're entering into a new arena. Um, central banks uh, have an objective now to devalue their currency makes them more competitive, imports inflation. But the tricky part of the equation is everyone is doing it. I was on a webinar the other day just listening to Christine Lagarde talk about uh, the recovery of Europe, uh, the IMF was on, and uh, she mentioned a number that absolutely staggered me, 20 trillion would be needed to get Europe back and fixed. And if you have a look at the complexity of how uh, welfare states have started to impede on uh, capital structures of businesses and economies. Uh, I think that plus the, the, the volume of money being put in by the central bank, BOJ, People's Bank of China, and also uh, the ECB is unprecedented. So it's become a very relative game. Ultimately, I think the dollar still maintains its value for the short term, but I think we're going to increasingly see the debate shift towards potentially things like special drawing rights at the IMF. And I think in this context, high yielding currencies and markets like South African Rand and South African bond market uh, do present a value opportunity in the short term. In the global macro fund that I run, as you mentioned, uh, I've been short USD since 19 through the futures market. I'm taking a few profits at the moment, but I think with South African bonds having blown out to the extent that they had, uh, the yield opportunity is rich in the short term for investors looking for that yield carry. But I think it will go the same way as companies longer term. The stronger your balance sheet, the more valuable your currency. Well, on that point, I mean, South Africa's balance sheet doesn't look to be in great shape. No. And we'll know next month with the, uh, the interim budget really how poorly or how badly we've been affected. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that one looks at if you have to make a call yeah. on the South African market, the currency, and even the equity market. One last comment on the equity market from your side, Tony. In what respect, Magnus? Yes or no? Do you like it? Does it offer value? The South African one? Yes. Okay. 
I think, I think the detail matters. I think there's certain companies in South Africa that have been through relatively difficult um, last few years. They've got their balance sheets in order. Uh, the valuations aren't particularly challenging. So I think whilst there's a value opportunity in South Africa, um, as somebody who runs both local and international money, uh, the difficulty that South African investors have got is that it's not obvious to me where the growth is going to come from. And so I think you play South Africa from a yield perspective through the interest rate instruments, and I think you play growth through the global markets uh, for every one company I can find in South Africa, I can probably find 20 offshore with significantly better growth prospects. And I think in a low interest rate world where duration of, of cash flow and earnings is important, uh, the international companies will still prevail. You know, I made tangential reference to China. Um, at VFM, we are looking to launch, up, launch a China fund in the not too distant future through some or other platform. And I think the growth opportunities will be rich in China simply because the capital formation process, the size of the market and the potential for companies to deliver earnings growth uh, is better than emerging um, com companies in emerging markets where the country balance sheets and the company balance sheets are effectively stuck. Well, you know, on that point, Tony, we did not rehearse that question. Um, that has, for, for, for the interest of, of, of new listeners, uh, that has been our asset allocation model at Brentis for the last five to six years. We've been avoiding the SO market, looking for yields in enhanced income funds and laterally in bond funds. And we simply said the SA market does not present us as a growth, a growth opportunity and we look for growth elsewhere, with, with the result that our exposure to the equity, SA equity market was about 5% of our entire portfolios, and the growth has been offshore to great results for our clients. On that point, I'd just like to mention to a lot of people listening to this who are older than 55 and have money in retirement annuities and pension funds, preservation funds, they need to urgently address the poor performance that they're experiencing by changing the asset allocation models, either by withdrawing their money or transferring to living annuities. It's of vital concern. We're doing that all the time, and we can turn your returns in from 2 to 3 percent, closer to 10 and 12 percent. And um, we, we, we urge people because otherwise there is a massive retirement crisis coming. We're getting a lot of questions coming through. Some are on specific stocks. We tend not to avoid on specific stocks. And someone has also emailed that the uh, email address I gave you is not operational yet, but it will be. So your questions will be answered in due course, invest at brentiswealth.co.za. And I'd like to thank everybody. More than 800 people are still listening and watching. And our contribution, contribution from Tony Danny, thank you very much and good luck and keep on the good work. And from all of us at Brentist, we say to you, goodbye and have a great afternoon. Good night.